Hello, this is the Critical Christian Podcast. I wanted to do this um, so that there is a place where uh, you know I and others could get together to understand politics, culture, and economics through a lens of faith in the God um, that we see in Jesus Christ. So what we're going to do, uh, we're going to dive into these issues, like looking at history and current events and different viewpoints of contemporary commentators. Um, and so we're going to seek to understand how Christians are called to participate in politics, culture, and economics um, as we ultimately you know, seek to worship God. And, you know, to be a blessing to the world and the people that he created. Um, you know, there's a big divide in the church today between conservative and liberal Christians. Those who voted for Trump or Biden, they're pro-choice or pro-life, they're pro-vax, anti-vax. This is a reflection of the division in our society as a whole. And both camps are quick to discredit the validity of the Christianity of the other based on where they stand. What's more, you know, I think we assume that the worst qualities of our respective political mascots belong to the people who voted for those people. You know, you voted for Trump, so you want to throw immigrant kids in cages, or you voted for Biden, so, you know, the blood of babies is uh, of aborted babies is on your hands this sort of thing this sort of rhetoric it's not helpful you know in in reality both sides are mostly just voting for what they perceive as the least of two evils but when these disagreements cause division and i'm specifically talking about divisions in the church these divisions are destructive and when we lose sight of our unity in jesus then we're not going to reach any conclusion and it's just going to devolve into chaos. Paul has a lot to say about this. Uh, if you look in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, he says, For just as the body is one and has many members, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. God has composed the body so that there may be no division in the body. For if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. So as Christians, you know, we should not be reflecting the divisions that exist in the world around us. No political party has a monopoly on righteousness, and no economic system is 100% just. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I want this podcast, this channel, to be a place where we can explore what that means. You know, healing the sick, feeding the poor. If we can listen to a variety of voices from across the spectrum, some Christians, some not, all with the intention to hear from God, if we can do the intellectually difficult work of sussing out true from false, right from wrong, in a complicated fallen world, we will be able to shine a light onto the path and hopefully be able to focus on working for justice. Up first, I want to showcase a very important historian and political activist, Howard Zinn. He died in 2010, uh, but his impact on how we study history and how we think about our government continues to inform today's greatest writers. He helped me to uh, you know, rethink my understanding of American history, to be less oriented around the admiration of uh, typical founding fathers, you know, George Washington, James Madison, Abraham Lincoln, and to question their status as American heroes. So, you know, Zinn's writings and lectures, they really taught me to broaden the canon of heroes, to include people like Harriet Tubman, Helen Keller, Eugene Debs, many others. 
In truth, all the heroes of history are complicated, a mix of good and bad, and the events and leaders of today are equally complicated. As we seek to understand the world and the country we live in, we're placing ourselves in it as Christians, followers of Jesus. And Howard Zinn's voice offers an incredibly valuable perspective that brings a certain realism to our understanding of history. It equips us with the skills to interpret the actions of our current political and cultural leaders with a clear-headed criticism. His writings are not without controversy. Mary Graybar from the Alexander Hamilton Institute has a book and YouTube video from a talk at Hillsdale College. It's a small Christian college in Michigan. Uh, and it's attempting to debunk Zinn, basically, calling him a charismatic Pied Piper, accusing him of turning his students against their college and country. I want to look at that accusation that Graybar makes against him, saying that he turned his students away from their college and country. Um, that, you know, that is not inherently a bad thing. Those students in his class at Spelman College rebelled against racism. They protested for civil rights in the 1950s, something I think all Christians today can agree was a positive movement, even a godly movement. Accusing Zinn of not upholding racial segregation in the 1950s or of turning his students away from the war in Vietnam is not debunking him or his history. It's calling out you know, the positive qualities of his activism and his leadership. You know, if you look at the first 300 years of Christian history, you know, it's one of nonconformity to the laws and mores of Rome. By refusing to worship all the different deities endorsed by the government of, of that day, Christians were threatening the public order. You know, so much so that they were martyred for their faith. So we look to those first early Christians and, you know, we can learn that our standard for right and wrong does not come from our educational institutions or our government. It comes from God. So it seems to me that Zinn's writings and teachings fall in line with Christianity more than Mary Graber's accusations and attempts to debunk him. I don't know much about Howard Zinn's faith or lack of it, but I do see a connection between what Jesus and the prophets said about justice for the poor and oppressed and what Zinn did to promote the voices of everyday poor and working class people, promoting their voices above the wealthy governors and presidents of the state that we know and we all typically learn about in school. In Matthew 20, 16, Jesus says, The last will be first, and the first will be last. What we perceive to be the natural power dynamic between master and servant in the kingdom of God, it's turned on its head. It's a kingdom in which the teacher, Jesus, washes the feet of his disciples, his followers. If we shift our outlook and expectations of the world to align closer with these illustrations from the life of Jesus, the perspective that Zen brought to history to lift up the voices of the poor and oppressed as opposed to the wealthy landowners, governors, and presidents, it doesn't seem that controversial. There are many great interviews and lectures of him online. But this one I'm about to play from C-SPAN in 1999 has particular significance because it features a crucial introductory question. How can our understanding of history help us in the future? And he's obviously he's not talking to Christians, but I want to interpret it as a Christian. And I want it, his talk to inform my understanding of how God wants me to interpret the events of our current day. But in this lecture, he talks about his motivation for writing a people's history of the United States. 
which is inspiring because it's ultimately encouraging everyday people like you and me to realize that our role and our voice, though lowly and not backed by the wealth and power of the leaders in today's system, can make a difference. And it's critical to upholding justice and peace in this world. In the lecture I'm about to play, Zinn says, you can't change the world if you're neutral. The world is already moving in certain directions. Wars are going on. Children are going hungry. Terrible things are being done. To be neutral in such a world is to collaborate with what is going on. You know, not to ascribe any explicit religious context to Zinn's words here. I'm definitely not attaching any messianic status to him by any means. Um, But this call to action does spark a connection in my mind, or at least it's perhaps a distant echo of Christ asking his followers to take up their cross and follow him. You know, the question I want to ask as we listen to this lecture is... How can Zinn's challenge to us, how can his words and viewpoint prompt us to take up our cross and follow Jesus? And without further ado, from the C-SPAN 2 vault, Howard Zinn. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm putting my watch down to pretend that I care. (laughs) Um, I don't know how much you know about my book or what's in the book. Maybe you know everything that I have to say to you. Uh, But... uh, I will talk about my book, uh, because I don't know what else to talk about. I'll tell you how I came to write it and why I came to write it in this funny way. And uh, I I wrote the book in the sort of late 1970s, uh, I guess when I had some breathing space after the anti-war movement. <laughs> you know, you know, during, during the anti-war movement, we were all doing all these furious things. You know, it was, you know, the center, many of you know this. The war was the center of our lives. And we were running around the country and doing this and that. And, and there was no time, uh, <laughs> certainly no time to write a 700-page book. So I was putting out little things, you know, a 125-page book uh, called Vietnam, The Logic of Withdrawal and a 100-page book called Disobedience and Democracy. And, I, you know, no more time. So, but now I had time, so I, I decided to write what people had been uh, looking for, or at least people would approach me and say, you know, you've, you've been teaching American history and so on. Can you recommend a, a good one-volume history of the United States from a, a radical point of view? No. <laughs> well, not really. Uh, I don't want to go into bibliographical detail about what there is and what there isn't, but not exactly, you know. Uh, but these were the demands that came out of the movements of the 60s. Because out of the movements of the 60s, people were looking for something different. People were remembering the kind of history they had learned in high school and college and were thinking, this doesn't fit what I see in the world today. And so they were looking for something and just uh, so I decided to write something to, to fill that need. Uh, now, yeah, clearly, those of you who know the book came, uh, uh, I know that I came to that history from a, a very definite point of view. Uh, and I guess this was because uh, when I began to study history, when I began to, when I d- decided I would, that's what I would do, I would write history and I would teach history, uh, I already knew that I was not going to be a neutral teacher. I was not going to be a neutral uh, historian. Uh, I have a memoir called, notice how I'm advertising all my books. Uh, (laughs) Isn't this a a book festival, you know? Yeah, I have many more, you'll hear many more things like that. Uh, And I'll just try not to mention other people's books. Uh, But the, uh, but, 
I, I, yeah, I wrote a memoir called You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train. And then the, the, the idea of it, is, it came from things I would say to my classes at the beginning of the class. I would say, now look, you know, uh, this is not going to be a neutral class. Uh, this is not going to be one of those classes in, where you spend a semester or a year with a teacher and at the end of the semester, at the end of the year, you have no idea where this teacher stands on the important issues of the day. We've all had teachers like that, right? There are a lot of them. No, I, I wasn't going to be neutral. I had a point of view, a strong point of view, uh, and uh, I wasn't going to hold back on it uh, because I didn't believe the, well, you might say I had a very modest desire in going into history. I just wanted to change the world. And, <laughs> and I figured you can't change the world if you're neutral. And besides, to be neutral, no. Uh, well, the, the world is already moving in certain directions. There's no such, there's no real thing, neutrality. It, it doesn't exist. The world is already moving in certain directions. Wars are going on. Children are going hungry. Terrible things are being done. To be neutral in such a world is to collaborate with what is going on. And so, no, I, I wasn't going to be neutral as a historian. And, uh, and yes, uh, I kind of knew as I started to write this book what my point of view uh, was going to be. And it came out of my background. It came out of my life experience. It came out of the fact that uh, at the age of 18, I uh, didn't go to college. I went to work in a shipyard, uh, stayed in the shipyard for three years. I didn't do it as a sociological experiment. <laughs> no. Ah, oh, let's go interview the shipyard workers and do an oral history of shipyard workers. Yeah, no, that wasn't it. You know, I just came from that kind of background, that kind of family, that kind of neighborhood and working class parents and so on, struggling. No, no thought of going to college when you got 18. Everybody around me went to work at the age of 18. So I worked in a, in a shipyard for three years and helped organize the young shipyard workers who were excluded from the AFL unions. Black people were excluded from the unions. Women were excluded from the unions. Unskilled workers were excluded. And so we formed the, uh, a kind of industrial union, an IWW almost. Uh, that's what we like to think, you know. Whenever we do something good, we like to compare ourselves to the IWW, you see. And we were, uh, so uh, you might say I grew up class conscious, uh, with a, a phrase you don't hear much in the United States, you know, that is, we're not supposed to, we're not supposed to have classes in the United States. We're all one big happy family, you see. And all of our interests are the same. You know, uh, Exxon and me, you know. <laughs> of, you know the, uh, and, you know, the founding fathers and all of us, you know. The, uh, I mean, the, the very, you know, name founding fathers, we're related by blood to those slave owners <laughs> who sat in on the making of the Constitution. Yeah, uh, no, we're, we're uh, no, we're not one big family, despite the, the attempts on the part of the establishment to draw us all in to this net and say our interests are one. You hear them talking about, oh, this, is this in our national interest? <laughs> uh, is this in the interest of national security? Actually, it may be in the interest of somebody's securities but not in the interest of <laughs> national security, you see. But all these world, these phrases are supposed to envelop us all in one common bond of interest instead, and thus hiding the fact that we are a society of many different interests, of uh, people who are rich and people who are poor and a lot of people in between who are nervous. And uh, so we, uh, you know, black and white and men and women and immigrants, no, it's... Uh, it's a, it's a society of, of people in, in stressful relationship with one another. And so uh, I wanted to write a history which would be from a class conscious point of view. Uh, I wasn't uh, going to write about the founding fathers and the making of the Constitution and, you know, and glorify the Constitution, which was written by 55 rich white men in Philadelphia. I, wa I wasn't going to do that, e even though, you know, I was taken aback for a moment when, you know, Ronald Reagan during the bicentennial year of the, of the Constitution, you know, 1987, Ronald Reagan wrote an essay 
Can you believe that? <laughs> Ronald Reagan wrote an essay for, uh, you know, some scholarly magazine, uh, Parade Magazine, uh, <laughs> in which he talked about the Constitution and said, you know, the, the, the Constitution uh, could only have been created with the guiding hand of God. You know, well, I thought this was really an insult to God. <laughs> when when you, you consider, you know, the Constitution was written to, to perpetuate the wealth, to perpetuate slavery, uh, to perpetuate things as they were, to replace the British ruling class with a local ruling class. That's what the Constitution was written for. I'm sorry to be so harsh on the founding fathers. They're nice guys. They look good. They dress well. <laughs> you know, they're very eloquent. Uh, but no, I was going to write about history from, from I, I, I didn't want to write about American industrial progress as it was presented to me in high school. It was presented to me in high school. I remember sitting there in class and uh, this is the period of the great American industrial revolution when America became a great economic power. You know, that period between the civil war and world war one when, when, you know, and I remember sitting there transfixed as the figures were put up on the board of how many more steel ingots were being produced each year. You know, how many miles of railroad track and the transcontinental railroad. Wow, how romantic and how beautiful. And we were so proud. Nothing was said in those classes and nothing was said in my textbooks about who worked on those railroads, about the Irish immigrants and the Chinese immigrants who worked on those railroads and died in great numbers in the sickness and the heat in those railroads. I was gonna, t was gonna tell about the great industrial miracle of the United States, that leaving out the girls who went to work in the textile mills of New England at the age of 12 and died at the age of 25. No. And I wasn't going to look at the, the, the state of, of the country from the standpoint of the Dow Jones average. You know, I mean, this, if you look historically, you know, and I was sort of prepared for this by, by some of my work in, in, in history. I was prepared looking back at eras which had been triumphantly proclaimed as wonderful eras. You know, remember the era of goodwill? Do they still have that in the textbooks? But they certainly have, you know, the, the Roaring Twenties, the Jazz Age, the Age of Prosperity. I mean, history is very simple. The Twenties were prosperous. Everybody was prosperous in the Twenties, and everybody was depressed in the Thirties. So, uh, what I did, I, I was doing a study of Fiorello LaGuardia, I, my, my first book. I mentioned another book, yes. <laughs> Never miss an opportunity. Uh, first, my my. My doctoral dissertation actually was on Fiorello LaGuardia. And a lot of you know who Fiorello LaGuardia is. Some people, yes, I mean, some people, you know, think, you know, he's an airport. You know. <laughs> but he was, you know, a lot of people know he was mayor of New York, very colorful character. But before that, a lot of people don't know this, and I didn't know this until I started working with him. He was a congressman in the 1920s, representing East Harlem, representing a poor district of East Harlem. An interesting congressman, the most radical member of Congress. Uh, he was a Republican and a socialist. <laughs> don't ask, don't ask me. Don't, don't ask me to explain that, you see. Uh, but but I, I would read the letters in the, that LaGuardia's constituents were writing to him from East Harlem in the 1920s in the age of prosperity. The Jazz Age and these letters from his constituents were saying, help me, you know, my husband is out of work, my kids don't have enough to eat, they've turned off the gas, you know, and, uh, and it was true all over the country, but nobody noticed it because the headlines were about the, the Wall Street and the stock market and how well it was doing. And, and you, I mean, you learn about today when you read about history. If you, if you don't learn about today, if you learn, don't learn about today when you're learning about history, then there's no, not much point, you know, except fun. Oh yeah, you have fun. But I never wanted to be a historian who went into the past and got lost. You know, there are, you know, you're going, it's, the past is interesting. You go in and you read those letters and the documents and it's detective work and it's fun, you know, but you can get lost there. And never, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to see what I could find and come out and apply it to what was going on in the world. 
Uh, I left the shipyard to enlist in the Air Force. Uh, and uh, you can tell I'm a kind of military person. Uh, and, uh, but it, it was, uh, it was, the, there was a war on. <laughs> uh, no, not the Spanish-American War. <laughs> no, it was World War II, the war against fascism, and I was imbued. There's a lot of young, uh, yeah, young radicals were imbued. Young, everybody, you know, yes, the war against fascism, let's, you know, and so I, I, I became a bombardier in the Air Force and flew bombing and dropped bombs and in the, where drop bombs are dropped, meaning not where they're intended to go. Uh, sometimes where they are intended to go, which sometimes is worse. But in any case, uh, I became a bombardier, and, 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 but I came out of this, this is the good war, as you know, right? This is the, the best of wars. Uh, I wrote a book. <laughs> I wrote a book once called Post-War America, and I had a chapter in it about World War II. And the chapter was called The Best of Wars. And Studs Terkel, you know, wrote The Good War uh, later. And, uh, and, but it's a wonderful book. If you notice, if you look at a book closely, the, the phrase The Good War in Studs Terkel's book is surrounded by quotation marks. Yeah. Because it's not that simple, it's not that clear, it's not that unambiguous, it's very complicated. And uh, I came out of that good war in which I had been an eager bombardier, came out of the war convinced that war solves nothing. The war doesn't solve fundamental human problems. And even when it seems to do so, even when it starts off looking that way, even when the enemy is vicious and you, because the enemy is vicious, you look good. This is a common mistake. The mistake is that if the enemy is evil, you must be good. Well, uh, it was, uh, I came out of the war uh, persuaded that uh, war, yeah, well, it didn't take long. There were those promises made in, in World War II. Those promises, you know, this would be, we're going to defeat fascism and we're going to have a, a wonderful new world, you know, right? We're going to have a world, you know, we're not going to have racism anymore because we're going to defeat Hitler. Hitler represents racism. We're not going to have war anymore. We're not going to have militarism anymore. No. We're going to have the UN. We're going to have, yeah. Well, it doesn't take much observation of the years that follow World War II uh, to begin to ask the question, if 50 million people died in World War II, what did they die for? For this kind of world with a perpetuation of war and militarism and racism, and yes, and fascism and nooks and crannies all over the world, including our own country. Fascism is not confined to national boundaries. Fascism exists in every prison in this country, really. You know, and uh, there exists in the military. There, there, you know, yeah. So, anyway, the point is that from this point on, uh, if I was going to deal in history with war, uh, in writing history and teaching history, I had a very strong point of view, and, and the point of view was anti-war. And my, my personal experience, uh, like dropping napalm on a little village in France <laughs> toward the end of the war uh, and killing <laughs> German, Frenchmen, whoever happened to be there, basically to test out napalm. That's the only reason I could figure out for doing it. It was the first use of napalm. You know, it's, uh, and then watching the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and, all, and then reading John Hersey and, and having the, the stories of the people Children caught in, in that. Uh, no, I, was, I wasn't going to be neutral on the question of war. And I wasn't going to look at war from the standpoint of the statesmen and of the decision makers, the generals. I was going to look at war from the standpoint of the GIs and the soldiers and the, the, the young men uh, cajoled and coerced into going to war. Uh, I also wanted to look at war from the standpoint of the other side. Yeah. And this is something you don't think about. Let's look at war from the standpoint of the enemy, the other people, right? Let's look at the Mexican war from the standpoint of the Mexicans. Well, when you look at the Mexican war from the standpoint of the Mexicans, well, here we are. <laughs> We're in Mexican territory, I mean, right? We, this, is, this was part of Mexico, and we stole it. <laughs> 
I mean, there's no other word for it. Uh, we, uh, we provoked a war with Mexico so that we could take half of Mexico. Some people thought we were being moderate. We should have taken all of Mexico. But no, we took... No, I wanted to tell a story of Mexico, of that war, yeah, from the standpoint of the GIs who woke up one day, uh, American immigrant kids who could just out of, for the same reason that most young people join wars, join out of desperation and, and need and desire to, to get ahead or whatever, you know, and then find themselves in a bloody mess, which they don't want any part of. And so they began deserting from the American army in the Mexican war. Uh, yeah, from their point of view and from the plant point of view of the, of the Mexicans. And so, you know, and so it was, it was my experience and it was history also. When I looked at the history of wars and the history of America's wars, you know, I know uh, there are good wars and bad wars. <laughs> good wars and bad, we have these lists, right? Good wars and bad wars. I had a student once who wrote, you know, they treat wars like lines. This is a good year, this is a bad year. He said, but war is not like wine. War is like cyanide. One drop and you're dead. Um, and, uh, and all the experience of, of you know, in all the other wars uh, since the war to end all wars, since World War II, uh, sort of uh, confirmed you know, what I felt about war. And, you know, and of course, right up to this very day. And I, and I wanted to, one of the things I wanted to get across to students is to lose their subservience to power, lose their subservience to authority, lose their subservience to the so-called experts. And there was no uh, more vivid lesson during the Vietnam War than lesson about experts. Now, I remember pe people at the beginning of the anti-war movement saying, well, now, wait a while, you know, uh, these people in Washington, I mean, why do you think they're there? They know what they're doing. Really? Really? <laughs> I mean, just look at the history of what people in Washington have done and ask, they know what they're doing? I mean, they, they, they can be five Beta Kappa, and they were in the Kennedy and Johnson administration. They were the, the best and the brightest. They were the smart, right? And... And, and they engaged in the most stupid and most immoral set of actions that we've had in the history of our country for a long time. So I wanted my students to, to learn to think for themselves and to, to, to learn and seek out information for themselves, not to depend you know, on the, what the president says, what the media say, or what the textbook said, not even what my book said, but to look things up for themselves and make up, make up their own minds. So, and then after I, I'm continuing my little autobiographical romp, you see, year by year, it will only take a few hours, and uh, the, so I, I went to college under the GI Bill. I love it when people say the era, you know, we mustn't have big government. We mustn't let government do things for people, right? Uh, government is doing too much for mothers taking care of kids who are collecting $350 a month. Really, you know, government's not good. It creates dependency. Oh, really? When we give billions of dollars to the, the corporations, does that create dependency? No. Uh, no. Uh, big government. And... Uh, it was different during the New Deal when people began to realize government, although government has mostly been on the side of the rich and powerful, it is possible sometimes for government to do something for the poor, as it did in the 1930s when it passed Social Security, of course, under the impetus of social movements, under the impetus of the labor movement, and so on, under the impetus of strikes all over the country and tenant strikes and so on. But good things were done by government in that time. Uh, and people have forgotten about that, and some people deliberately want to forget about that and say, big government is no good. Uh, but the GI Bill was big government. It was the government uh, giving 
four years of free education to everybody who served in World War II. And so I went through my entire educational thing right up through the PhD, never paid a dollar in tuition. Uh, I know the young people looking at me rather enviously at this point. Uh, yeah, so I studied history at NYU, Columbia. My first teaching job, Spelman College, Atlanta, Georgia, black women's college. And uh, did Marion arrive yet? No, she may never arrive. No, she'll arrive. <laughs> yes, she'll arrive. Uh, but uh, seven years at Spelman College, um, my wife and kids uh, got into our old Chevy and went down to Atlanta and spent the next seven years, 1956 to 63, uh, very special time to be in the South and to be living in the black community and to see the, the first, the, 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 you know, the tremors under the surface uh, begin to develop and then see things burst out in 1960, you know, with the sit-ins in 61 with the Freedom Rides and 62 and 63 in Albany, Georgia and Birmingham and the mass demonstrations and the you know, and thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people being involved, an amazing, amazing episode in our history out of which I learned an enormous amount. Uh, I certainly learned more from my years at Spelman than my students learned from me. Uh, I learned a lot about politics, I learned about education, I learned a lot about democracy. Uh, I learned about, well, one thing I learned about education, you know, the business of, you know, you see history from a different point of view. When you look at history from a black point of view, it looks different. You know, you look at history from a women's point of view, it looks different. From a, yeah, and uh, from a Native American point of view, uh, from Native American point of view, Take the Revolutionary War. As we know, that was a good war, uh, right? How can you beat the Revolutionary War? I, you know, it's, it, it's, you know, there are the statues all over. There. I mean, here I come from Boston. I mean, Boston would die if not for the Revolutionary War and the, and the statues that it can have in its public square. But, but Boston needs the, you know, all of that. Uh, but. Uh, and the Revolutionary War, yes, it, it, it freed us from England. From the point of view of the Indians, it was a disaster. The British had set a line beyond which the colonists could move west into Indian territory. Proclamation of 1763. We win the war against England, we abolish the line, and then we move into Indian territory and all across the country. And then follows a hundred years of massacres, right? Uh, another sort of very neglected set of episodes in American history. Uh, all I learned about was Sitting Bull at Custer's Last Stand. Uh, but from history from a black point of view looks, looks certainly different. The heroes look different. Uh, the, uh, all the traditional heroes look different. The eras and their names look different. You know, everybody learns about the progressive, everybody who takes American history learns about the progressive era in American history. Right? I don't, they, still, they must still have that in the books. It's always the progressive era, the first 20 years of the 20th century, when it's called a progressive era because very, various reforms were passed, you know, the uh, railroad regulation uh, and uh, the Meat Inspection Act. Notice how good our meat is as a result of that. And uh, the, uh, the you know, Federal Reserve System, the Federal Trade Commission, the direct election of senators, et cetera. Yeah. Graduated income tax. I ah, notice how graduated our income tax is these days. Yeah. Well, anyway, but reform. So it's the progressive era. Those were exactly the years those, that in that progressive era when more black people were lynched in this country than in any other period of American history. So, you know, I began to read the black historians who are not on my reading lists in Columbia. Really, they were not. Uh, and then, of course, I learned, you know, well, just by becoming involved in the movement, just becoming involved in that movement that, you know, that my students uh, initiated. They, they always think that faculty, you know, whenever students are involved, you notice that during the Vietnam War, they think faculty must have, some faculty person must have instigated. It's never that way. The students start it, the faculty people come in, you know, some. But you learn about, uh, Learned a lot about education. Learned that education is not simply what you get in the classroom, it's what you learn out in the midst of a social struggle. I remember uh, when my students, when 
Marion and a whole bunch of other uh, students of Spelman and Morehouse, etc., were getting arrested in downtown Atlanta for sitting in. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, a political scientist, uh, PhD from Johns Hopkins, I want to give him his full due before I <laughs> wrote a letter to the Atlanta Constitution deploring that his students were missing class and going downtown to participate in these demonstrations, their education, they're losing out on their education. Well, obviously, this man was losing out on his education. He didn't understand what education was and didn't understand that people learn more in the heat of social struggle uh, than they can simply by books and classrooms. Sure, books and classrooms are good, and you come back from the picket line and come back to the classroom and you want to read more, learn more, you want to read more history of what it is you were involved with. So, yeah, I, I learned a lot. I learned, I learned from my students. I, I learned, well, I learned never to mistake silence for uh, agreement. <laughs> You know, no, because you, know, you look, you looked at the surface. You, looked, you came to Spelman College in 1956. Things look, look quiet. Everybody's well behaved. People are going. You know, they're doing their lessons. They're going to do the right things to become successful. Do what their parents want them to do, and and become, you know, so people of some substance and use in the black segregated community, right? Uh, uh, well. That's the way it looked. Uh, and you could, looking at that surface of quiet and silence, you would say, as some people, so many people say about students today or about people today, where are they? They're not doing anything, you know. Never look at the surface of things. This is what I learned. And I always assume that if something is wrong, there's a, under the surface, there's a kind of un uh, common sense understanding that something is wrong. I believe in this country there's a common un sense understanding that there's something wrong with spending 270 billion dollars on weaponry when 40 million people are without health insurance and and health you know other you know there's kind of people understand that you know and people fundamentally understand things you know and uh, uh, but very often they're quiet about it. They're practical. Uh, they're waiting for the right moment. They're waiting for somebody to make the first move. Uh, and uh, and so, you know, at a certain point, the, my, my students at Spelman burst out, you know, of that silence. And, and they and, and young people and older people all over the South, uh, black people uh, all over the South, uh, just... Uh, galvanized the country and the world and embarrassed the U.S. government into finally doing something. Uh, one of the things we learned at that time, you don't depend on the government. Uh, don't depend on even the most liberal government. I mean, we had had liberal governments and conservative governments. We had Democrats and Republicans for a hundred years in this country after the passage of the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment was supposed to guarantee racial equality and, and it didn't matter who was in power in Washington. They didn't do a thing to enforce the 14th Amendment until black people in the 1950s and 1960s came out en masse and embarrassed the government of the United States into doing something. And that was when democracy came alive. Democracy is not a set of, of procedures. It's not a, a framework. Uh, democracy is people giving you something to drink when you're thirsty. You know. uh, uh, and uh, so, yeah, democracy came alive in the 60s. No, democracy, as I said, is not, you know, it's not what we learned in junior high school. Ah, this, this is democracy. I'm going to put it on the blackboard. Here are the three branches of government, executive, legislative, judicial. Here's the Constitution. That's democracy. Vote every two years, four years. That's democracy. No, no. If we depended on that, we would be lost more than we are. Uh, the thing that changed things to the extent that they did change for black people, for working people in this country, uh, for women, for disabled people, uh, for people against what well, things 
uh, the government of the United States did not initiate any of the things that were necessary to remedy those grievances. People had to go out and create movements uh, in order to bring that about. And then if the movement became strong enough and loud enough uh, and persistent enough, then the government responded. So that was the lesson of democracy. Uh, so, uh, uh, what else should I say? <laughs> what, what other books of mine haven't I mentioned? Uh, uh, I hear there's a documentary being made about people's history. What's that? I hear there's a documentary being made about people's history. Well, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> uh, it's possible. But so how about questions? How about questions? Yes, I'm finished. Yeah. Yeah. There's a microphone set up back there. There's a microphone set up right back there in case people can't oh. protect. Oh. Uh, is it bad if people speak from their seats? Yeah. Does uh, C-SPAN not like that? <laughs> and who do you think we're doing this for? <laughs> Mike, what? You want people to line up behind the mic? Yeah. Well, can, is it, is, can people speak from their seats? Is that all right? No. no. And then I repeat the question yeah. and distort it as I usually do. Okay. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. I have a question. I'm curious about Gallaudet University. In 1988, the big revolt was called Deaf President Now. And deaf people really mobilized. And then they closed the university. It was at that time called the college. They closed it for a week to do the deaf president now revolt. So I'm wondering, that had a large impact on American history. At least deaf people think so. But I was looking in the section about history during that period of time, and there was no mention at all of Deaf President Now. Yeah. So it hasn't really impacted American history according to the books. My, my book? Or well, books generally? Um, well, general I, history generally, books. General history including books. my book. Yeah, really, I, I'm, I'm ashamed to say this. No, but no. from time to time, people have pointed out so things I've missed opinion. in my book. You know, I've missed a lot. Yeah, and uh, and you know, when the first edition of the book came out, I, I really didn't do justice to the struggles of Chicano people in this country. Uh, didn't do justice to the struggles of gay and lesbian people in this country. Didn't do justice to the struggles of disabled people or, you know, to this event, which was, a, I remember that event, and, and to me it was such a perfect example of democracy coming alive where, you know, the students protest in this remarkable way uh, to have a president who represents their own situation. Yeah, and th that was a, a wonderful event. And I'm gonna make note of it for the ne next time there's another printing of my book. And the printings come fast. So I, I will make a, really, I'll make a note of that. I wish you'd send me some stuff, okay? Do you do, you do email? Do you do email? No, I, I'm not a card person. <laughs> no. I'm not. Yes, I have email. Yeah, email. But I don't know your email address. I'll tell you my email address. It's, God, everybody's listening. <laughs> don't listen. H Zin. H Zin. At. B U dot E D U. Got it? H Zen at B U. Be it like a boy. Dot E D U. Yes. Many of us. 
thought that the World War II was just another imperialist war being fought between two powers trying to capture territory. But then after World War II, seeing what Hitler had done, seeing what the role of Hitler had been, some of us changed, began to think about that war as maybe it was, had been necessary to fight in it. What, I just wondered what your, whether you had changed in, in your estimation. That, do you want me to repeat? Do I have to repeat that? Oh yeah, She's asking me the most difficult question. That I get that question a lot, and it is, I'm, if I could rec if I could know in advance that a person would ask that question, I wouldn't recognize them. Because <laughs> uh, this, uh, the, uh, but there, there it is. It's out. She's asking me about World War II and saying that she started off with the notion it's an imperialist war, you know, imperialist on both sides. But then when, when, with the stories of the death camps, you know, and the Holocaust and all of that, she changed her mind about the war. Well, it's the reason I say it's a tough question because it's very, very complex, you know, and, uh, you know, this, let me say this, something had to be done about fascism, right? Something had to be done about Hitler. The only question is whether it had to be done in the way that it was done and whether it didn't come late, you see, late, because the main concern of the, of the nations fighting the war was not the Jews and not racism and not militarism. It wasn't their concern, you see. And, but it's true that even, you know, there, there are unintended consequences of bad <laughs> intentions, right? And so um, uh, the, thing, the thing I would come away from, talk, I'd, I'd say World War II is complex. We did not have to kill huge numbers of civilians in German cities, and we didn't have to drop the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and I didn't have to drop napalm on this little town in France. So something had to be done about fascism, and, and the question that's left is, was there any way to fight against fascism uh, without, at some point in the war, beginning to duplicate the atrocities of the other side, you see? I mean, that's a big question, and it's a very unanswerable question, because it's all gone. The only, I'll just say one more thing. The problem with World War II having such elements of goodness and questioning about it, the problem with it is, that is the ambiguity of World War II. Uh, uh, the problem with that is that to the extent that World War II can be seen as a good war, it cast a soft glow on every war that has followed since. Wars which don't have that ambiguity. Wars which are crass imperial wars. But World War II is, is used, it's used as a, a metaphor and it's used to justify Korea, Vietnam, the Gulf War, Kosovo. It's they pull it out every time, you see, to, to help them justify unjustifiable killing. So World War II is past. The real question is how do we react to the wars today and how do we react to, to the wasting our enormous national treasures on preparation for war? Yes. I wanted to ask about your involvement with the End the Sanctions Against Iraq campaign. My involvement with what? The End the Sanctions Against Iraq campaign. Oh, oh campaign. my involvement with the Sanctions Against Iraq campaign. Uh, you all know about the sanctions against Iraq. You all know that we've been carrying on ever since the Gulf War. It's interesting how many Americans don't know about it. If you took a poll in the United States and asked, how, you would find most Americans do not know that we've been carrying on a campaign of sanctions which have killed hundreds and hundreds of thousands of children, children in Iraq. Which leads me to a parenthetical remark. No, I'll, I'll hold that. Uh, let me know when Marion arrives. Uh, somebody, you know, like we have a spotter. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, I mean, I haven't been involved, been involved in it except talking about it, you know, and telling about it. I haven't been one of those heroic people who, in the voices of the wilderness, who have those 
people who are breaking the law, the American law, and, and bringing food and medicine to Iraq, and they've done it, you know, 15, 16 times. And one of the most shameful episodes in recent American history carried on by, you know, the liberal Clinton administration, really, and justified by it in the most awful ways. And uh, the, uh, uh, and, I mean, sort of, there's an enormous disproportion of attention to atrocities depending on what the people in power want us to pay attention to. And uh, I mean, all atrocities should be paid attention to. But the fact is, if, if, if thousands of people are killed in Kosovo, that is brought to our attention, and it should be brought to our attention. Although the thousands of people we then kill in bombing in order presumably to do something about it, that's not brought to our attention. And the hundreds of thousands of people who die as a result of our sanctions, that's not brought to our attention. We have a real problem in getting past what the media tells us is important uh, and deciding for ourselves on the basis of searching out independent sources of information, deciding for ourselves what really is important. I don't know what else I can say about it. I, don't, I have a feeling that you know, sometimes behind questions, you know there's an answer, right? That is, the people who ask the questions, they know the answer they want, right? And I feel there's an answer you wanted which you didn't get. Am I right? No, I, actually, I just I saw your name in the newspaper with with oh. many other scholars, and I just wondered how you got involved with the issue. Well, you wonder how I got involved. Yeah. That's easy. Getting involved is easy. You know, people get to know after a while who would get involved in such a thing. <laughs> you see, and you know, and if you know, and if you know, uh, you know, if I can, you know, be on, you know the list of American airlines, or whatever, I can certainly be on the stop sanctions against Iraq list. Uh, yes. Oh, there's a man way back there who's held his hand up for a long time. Why is it so extraordinarily difficult for either the government and or private enterprise to provide at least sufficient shelters for the homeless, particularly in our urban centers. Because I recall a sh a some time ago a man who wanted to open up, I think, a deserted post office warehouse right next to the White House, and he had to fast. And he finally got on TV, and somehow the federal government opened up that warehouse for temporary shelter. I mean, again, along with your point about 444 million people not insured in our country with health insurance, it's very shameful that we cannot provide at least shelter for the homeless. Is it not? I mean, uh, well, that's obvious. Is it, not shame? Is it not shameful? <laughs> yes. Uh, that's an easy one, yeah. right? Is it because but, the politicians... The, 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 the homeless people don't vote, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. a lot of, uh, you know, and therefore it... it uh, <laughs> It, uh, and very often, you know, the people who are the most, most agreed, most harassed, have the least resources to fight back, and therefore they depend on the rest of us to speak up for them, like prisoners in jail who are not in a position to fight back, you know, and who, who uh, and, you know, and, and they need people on the outside to advocate for them. And the same thing is true of the homeless. It's, uh, you know, instead of asking, I'm oh, sure we should ask, why isn't the government doing this? And we should ask, you know, why aren't the people who have homes speaking up in loud voices for the homeless? You know. uh, who's had a hand up for a long time? I, go ahead. Yes. I'm curious about uh, individual acts of violence as part of revolution and what you think, is there a separation? Is there a, a time at which individual acts of violence are... Um, effective and uh, a good idea oh. as opposed to war? Hmm. Uh, she asks, uh, maybe you got, did you all get that? No. But she asked about, I, I'm obviously speaking against the violence of war, and she asked me, what about the violence of individuals? I, I assume you mean the violence of individuals, presumably for some good purpose, right? Uh, uh, and, uh, well, it always looks, violence is very tempting uh, because it very often seems to offer a quick solution for a problem. 
that you face. But it's poisonous. Uh, it's, uh, it has consequences uh, which simply spread uh, the idea of violence it's, and which reinforce uh, the acts of violence that are carried on, on on a large scale. In fact, the two things reverberate. The government's acts of, of violence, I believe, uh, encourage those individual acts of violence, which then are deplored. Oh, how horrible that they, you know, they, they, you know, they blow up the right the building in Oklahoma City, or they, you know, they do this, and and that's looked upon with horror by the same uh, people who were ready to kill thousands of people and have, you know, in bombing campaigns. There's a connection between the two. There's a connection between violence in the schools and violence in the streets and violence that comes out of Washington, and we we ought to you know, think about that kind of hypocrisy. Uh, but I don't, I don't believe that violence uh, is a, a solution. Uh, I think uh, the, the poet June Jordan, who lives, I think, somewhere in, in the Bay Area, talked, when she talked about the Gulf War, you know, she said, uh, war is, is, like, is like crack. It's a quick fix. And then, you know, when it, it's over, you know, you realize what, what, what terrible harm has been done. I think the great, the great problem for human ingenuity in this next hundred years, now that we're you know, at this date in the calendar, we like to talk about the next hundred years very wisely. And, but I think that you know, the problem you know, is how do we solve the fundamental problems of hunger and disease you know, uh, and uh, injustice and how do we do it without killing large numbers of people that is how do we do it while renouncing war you know as a solution you know that's the, how, i mean that's what i mean that's what human ingenuity is, should be used for